So a little bit of background about myself and about uh, my company, Glide. So we've been in business now for about three years. And um, in that time, we have, uh, we've been installed in a, it's a, Glide is an instant video messenger, meaning that we have a unique way to send and record videos from mobile device to mobile device, one to one, one to many, faster than any other technology that exists in the world. And we've wrapped this around a communication application for your iPhone or Android. You can think of it like uh, WhatsApp uh, for video or a video mirrors, video walkie talkie. Uh, we have been installed in over 25 million devices. We've raised over $30 million and we have, our users have sent over 2 billion messages on our platform since it was launched a little over two years ago. So it really, uh, it, it comes to back to the problem that we were trying to solve, which was the three founders were Olim, and we moved here from uh, various parts of the world, and we wanted to be able to communicate with our families in intimate manners. Uh, we found that uh, text messaging was troublesome for that, and it didn't really solve what our needs, neither did Skype, which was pretty much impossible to arrange. Um, and one of the things that we noticed is that human beings are visual communicators. That was, that this was the first uh, thing that we had, was that you, know, you have to find your core principle in your business, and our core principle was that human beings are visual communicators. This is actually my son here. He was born about four months ago, and you can't really equate these two images. So that's a little bit of a background. Okay, so now this, this uh, lecture that I wanted to give is something that I've been thinking about for a long time. It's uh, going back to a quote from a guy named Henry Ford. Are you guys all familiar with this quote here? <laughs> I, I know it's late in the day. So what he says is, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And this is a problem that I've found in our company and with many other startups, is that it's so easy to collect data from your users, to understand their behaviors, to give surveys to them, to do usability testing, that oftentimes you'll be overwhelmed with the amount of data that you collect, and that data can actually limit your ability for creative thought. Now let's just do a, a simple thought experiment. What would have happened if Henry Ford had had um, mix panel, or he had had uh, uh, NFC devices, or anything else? He could have put uh, strips down in the road. Well, he would have seen which uh, horses can run faster, which ones need to eat more, which ones need uh, you know, to sleep more, which breeds are better, which streets end up cutting the, the horse's hooves. And all of this information would have been great information that he collected, but it would not have led him to this product, which had extreme product market fit, probably one of the most successful products that's ever existed in the world. I'm sure all of you are familiar with the automobile, and you, many of you probably use an automobile to get here today. So what's the problem that we have as data scientists and as owners of businesses with collecting data and then ending up with something like this? And, and that problem is really of focus and creativity. It's of understanding that, it's of understanding, I'm gonna skip through this, what the aha moment is. Now what the aha moment is when your user, when your client, really understands why your product is valuable and what it enriches in their life, what it does for them. And it does this to such an extent that they can't stop talking about it. Are you guys familiar with uh, Net Promoter Scores? Net Promoter Score is a great way to monitor whether or not what you are doing is successful. It asks a very simple question. It says, how likely are you to recommend this product to your friends? If you have a high Net Promoter Score, you're, this is a product that's going to grow. If you have an extremely high net promoter score, then you're gonna go viral. If you have a low net promoter score, then you're probably going to have to spend a, a ridiculous amount of money on marketing, or you're going to not be able to gain traction or really enter into the market. So every, how do you identify what is your aha moment? And this is really where the data science comes in. This is where I found in the last three, two years or so that we've been really collecting data. And if you're curious, we use Amazon. We have, uh, we have an Android app and an iPhone app. We pump the data to Kinesis. Then we transform the data and we store it in the, a warehouse called Redshift. And then we manipulate the data and visualize it uh, using ClickSense and Pentaho. 
So if you're not familiar with any of those things, I highly recommend that you check them out. We've tried a whole plethora of solutions, and these have been very successful with us. So what is it exactly that you're looking for? You're looking for an action that was primarily uh, taken by the users that retained and not by the users that were left off. Now, in Glide, looking at this, what we found was users that sent messages on two different days during their first week. If you sent messages for two different days on your first week, then it was very likely that we were gonna see you a month down the road, two months down the road, six months down the road. If you didn't experience this aha moment within your first week, then it was very challenging to get you to stay and even to bring you back if some of your friends joined later down the road. So now that we had understood this metric, we really had to understand what's going on underneath. The data is only going to give you that tip of the iceberg, but the real story, what you're all trying to do as business owners, what I'm trying to do, is understand what, how do you wag the dog? How do you tweak something in your product so that you can cause the most amount of people to be able to experience this aha moment? Because that's without, without the a actual application of your data, it doesn't matter how much data you collect or how pretty your dashboards are, are or how big the screen is that you display them on because it's useless data without an actionable item. So there were a couple things that we found, and we found it by not just uh, talking, we found it through talking to our users. And it was talking to our users that were both retained and not retained, and asking them specific questions around this aha moment that we had discovered. What we asked them was, well, why did you not come back? Well, what was, what's the biggest problem? You seem to really like it. You used it a bunch of times on that first day, well, why, why weren't you inspired? And we heard something very interesting. We actually heard two things. Uh, one was that, oh, well, you know, video messaging is heavy and it takes up too much room on, on our device, which, and I skipped over the slide of our unique value proposition for time, is one of the problems that we've overcome. Meaning that Glide, you can send as many messages as you want. It's all stored in the cloud. Nothing takes up any room on your device. So that was interesting. You, what we found was that users were being prevented from experiencing an aha moment because they didn't really understand our core value proposition, what separated us from things in the market. So that was number one. There was a significant communication problem that needed to be overcome through product changes. The second thing that we heard from our users was, I don't have any friends that are using it. My friends are not on it. Just like with Skype or with Snapchat or Viber, in order to be able to use the application, you need other, uh, other friends that are on the application. So one of the things that we noticed was that, well, actually, a lot of the people who gave us that answer that weren't retained did have friends that were on it. So why didn't they understand that they had friends that were using our application? And that led us to rearranging how we showed different users. We ordered it by users uh, last time that they were online, last time that they logged in, or uh, based on your favorite contact list. So by listening to what our users' pains were uh, and understanding what was preventing them from achieving the aha moment, we were able to increase the amount that they were, uh, the amount of users that were achieving this level of success even to the extent that we added a new feature which allowed for users to send videos to non-users. And this was a big debate internally. And this, I'll, I'll go off on a tangent. How many of you have ever sat down with the same dashboards with your business partner or somebody else on your team and the two of you had completely different interpretations of the data? Raise, raise your hand any, any time. Okay, we, we've seen that. I remember very specifically when we were in a beta phase uh, we had to limit, because of scalability, the size of group chats to 50 uh, participants. And uh, there was a big debate about whether it should be 50 or 100 and the costs associated with that. And when we had just a couple hundred active daily users, uh, or actually, no, it was a couple thousand daily active users, I remember looking at the stats of seeing the error reports of how many times yesterday uh, one of our user, uh, how many users had tried to create a group that was over 50? And it was a number in the, um, you know, some, uh, a few dozen, let's say around 45. And I remember looking at that and saying, wow, 45 people, 
that's a significant percentage. We have to increase the group size. We have to invest more in the scalability of the multicast. And I remember one of my uh, partners looking at me and saying, 50? What, that's nothing. Why would we ever put our focus there? And that's one of the problems when you just have data to be able to understand the value that you bring to your users. So putting effort into underlying the under, understanding the underlying story is essential. And I believe that it's best done through direct communication, whether it's face-to-face -face communication with your users, whether it's through surveys with your users, or whether in our case, we actually glide a bunch of our users. So we have video chats with them. It's not applicable for everyone's business, but we found it has uh, uncovered many, many gems. So um, now we're gonna get to the flexibility, okay? One of the biggest challenges that we had was staying focused on what was our core value proposition of being a video communicator, okay? We envisioned uh, this product solving some of our own problems, which was I hated Skyping with my mother, but I wanted to be able to maintain a personal relationship with her. So in order to do that, I needed to build, unfortunately, an application that would allow me to instantly send her videos and not have to, every couple days, teach her how to delete information off of her phone. So thus, we invented Glide. Now, that, that product that we brought to market resonated with many of our users, but for different pains. And we saw, when we heard this pain of, I don't have any friends, which prevented people from reaching the aha moment, we saw some, an opportunity that was too alluring to, uh, to not jump on. And that was to create a side project called Discover People, which we incorporated into the application. Now, this was a side project that was based on the data analysis of our aha moment, was uh, matured through direct communication with our users, and then was introduced into the product late uh, on a Thursday afternoon by one uh, developer and a project manager, um, almost uh, behind the back of everyone else in the company. Uh, it was something that was debated, so we decided we were going to do it as a trial. We would make it very easy for users to be able to post their, uh, their um, access credentials, their Glide ID, on Twitter, and we called it Discovery. Then what we did is we added a web view, which allowed for you to browse a search of a, a filter on Twitter of other people that had also posted this. It took about half an hour to write, but the impact was dramatic. Users that were complaining to us that, their, that the reason they didn't want to use our product was because their friends weren't on it, were actually now exploring and were communicating with complete strangers. And what we found was that when a user communicated with a stranger, they were far more likely to reach that aha moment. Now they, they weren't limited by people that they knew. They could reach out and have new experiences, new relationships through our product. And this brought them to the first aha moment. Yep, question? Well, that's a completely different product. How would you like nothing in your data analysis project this? Uh, that's why it was an experiment that took half an hour to do. Uh, you're absolutely right. And that's why uh, what I'll get to is, if it wasn't, uh, is this. Is that when you don't do experiments and you just look at the data, you end up building this, not an automobile. And one of our, ch which solves the exact same problem and caters to the same market, but it's far less efficient and it's a far more challenging uh, mountain to climb. When we all have the vision of success for our businesses, and that vision, it, it gives us direction, and it gives us strength, and it gives us focus. But at the same time, we can't let that focus steer us away from taking risks, from being creative or inventive, and from trying things that, in a tangential way, uh, overcome the problems that are pre uh, preventing our users from becoming daily active users, from becoming retained users, from achieving the aha moment. So actually what my lecture is here today is almost an anti-data lecture. It's saying that data is essential, you have to be collecting it, but you cannot run your business as a data scientist. You must run your business as an artist, an artist that's being supported uh, standing on the back of the data scientists. 
you can elaborate on this, because I guess product managers wouldn't want to fail. They wouldn't want to experiment and fail, so that's why they would want to use the data to support their, their uh, future experiments. And how do you manage that from a managerial uh, well, that's a, that's a great question, and I'd say one of the things that we found most successful with that and, uh, is A-B testing, is only releasing your experimental features to a small number of users. We actually were registering our users via their phone numbers, so it was very easy for us to deliver it to 10% of our users, we just, or 20% or 30%. We just picked whatever was the last digit of your phone number, and if it was below a certain amount, then you got the new feature. And actually, while I give this story of the uh, of uh, the discovery application as a success story, we've had far more failure stories. We tried to create a video voicemail side application that was that crashed and burned terribly. We've uh, tried to do uh, multiple reminders or overlays, uh, which also crashed and burned terribly. So you can't expect that in your uh, in your exploration of maturing your product that you're always going to hit success. And that's why it's important to walk a little bit on eggshells and or tread the water, um, whatever the end of that uh, idiom is. But what's most important is that you keep that same sense of uh, wonder and excitement that led you to become an entrepreneur in the first place and that you embrace that as your company grows and as you uh, raise more capital and as the risks become greater that you don't lose what that, that core essence that brought you to this industry in the first place. Thank you. Five users. Um, we weren't sure if that's a, a meaningful, meaningful amount um, to guarantee adjusting to. Uh, can you elaborate on how you you settled that with your partner and what directed you? Gut and what our gut was is that it wasn't the right time or place based on the uh, technical. Uh, commitment that it would be uh, involved to follow through with that. But I am happy to say that we did recognize the value of group chats uh, as a, I would say that one of the, looking at what are the most valuable actions that a person can do is to send a video SMS to a not, exist, a, a not yet registered user, a uh, person who's never downloaded the application or heard of it, uh, to, to have two conversations uh, on two different days in the first week, which was very interesting to see that two conversations on the same day was far less impactful than two conversations on two different days, and to create group chats. Group chats are incredibly powerful, and we've recognized it now, and we've actually increased the limit because of that. But it did take two years. Did you, did you kind of um, recognize the importance of knowing whether that's a nice to have for the users or a must have, and, and if so, how did you check that out? So it's interesting to look at it from that perspective of whether it's a nice to have or whether it's a must have. From our perspective, it's actually, group chat in particular has fallen into the category of, of uh, it is one of our big, highest priorities to get you to create a group chat. Because if you create a group chat, especially with your family, then that's it, we've got you. This will be your preferred way to communicate with your family. family. What's that? Uh, it's something to that effect. So it's, uh, but not particularly if it's going to be of large volume. So that's also the double side of the coin, is that a small, intimate group chat is far more powerful than a large group chat, which is most likely going to be muted, and thus might as well not exist. How, how did you get the first set that uh, you had a few thousand users? And first, how did you get the few first thousand? Uh, so that most of the first, uh, first let's say, 5,000 users came through targeted uh, acquisitions on Facebook, uh, which is great because then you get to, it, it's almost working backwards. You get to try different segments and then see which ones stick. And there's a plethora of tools which will allow you to then link which segments on Facebook or which ad campaigns were retained to various different amounts. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys.